there's probably not a more provocative topic to cover than the mark of the beast. It has been requested more than any other topic. But it is really different than nearly any other topic to discuss. If you take something like the Temple in Jerusalem or the Two Witnesses or nearly any other Second Coming or Last Days topic, you can find that there are many references in Scripture, that there are many prophets and apostles that have talked about it, and from those sources we can better understand these topics. This is not such a topic. There are only a few places in Scripture that even mention it at all and all of them are part of John the Revelator's apocalyptic writings in the book of Revelation, which can be difficult to wade between what is symbolic and what is real. This doesn't include scriptures that may be referring to it, but could also be referencing something else because it isn't specific. For example, just because Daniel mentions a beast doesn't necessarily mean he is referencing the same mark of the beast that John in Revelation is. So I'm talking about direct references. Apostles and prophets haven't discussed it much in public, recorded forms anyway. The Guide to the Scriptures and the Topical Guide and the Bible Dictionary are all silent, and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has no official position on what it even is. So this leaves us with very few verses and the surrounding context of the book of Revelation to make any sense of this subject other than a few student manuals I'll reference later. In fact, if you want a formula on figuring out the odds of misunderstanding the interpretation of a prophecy, you can take the number of references to that specific thing found in Scripture and divide it by the number of Google results you get on the same topic. Now that's a little facetious, but you get my point. So what does Scripture say about the mark of the beast? Revelation 13 verse 16 says, And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. This leads me to one of the greatest learning habits that you can adopt in your own study of the scriptures if you want to exponentially increase your understanding. And it is super easy to implement. I can't believe how much this has helped me. For me, at least, it's on my list of top five ways to better understand the scriptures. The problem is that we live in a soundbite society and we read one verse and then people try to interpret that one verse in isolation rather than the context the writer originally intended. So if you want to combat that and want to understand scriptures better, read at least 20 verses before and 20 verses after. If we do that here, that pretty much means that we need to read all of Revelation chapters 13 and 14. While we are on the subject of better study habits, another thing that you should do when studying the Old and New Testament is always use Joseph Smith's translation. The one I use is the one that was published by the Community of Christ Church, and you can get it for $25 on Amazon. What is great about this version is that it has one column with the original King James Version and the other column with the Joseph Smith translation. This has all of the Joseph Smith's inspired changes, which is much more than we have in the back of our scriptures. And so you can be comfortable our church did verify that this publication is accurate with all of Joseph's work, so it can be trusted. That being said, it can get difficult to always have to look up each scripture in the Joseph Smith translation. So a while back, I took all of the book of Revelation and updated it with the inspired Joseph Smith changes. But I didn't just change it, I color coded it and I used the strikeout feature so you can see the Joseph Smith translation and the original King James Version all together. So now you can read the entire book of Revelation in the Joseph Smith translation form. I also added other scripture references, quotes by prophets and apostles, and other material to help you with your study of the book of Revelation. I'll put the link to this 33-page study guide in the description below if you want to download and print it out. Since so many things seem to take me to another part of the book of Revelation, I keep a copy of that with my scriptures to study. As it turns out, however, chapters 13 and 14 don't have a ton of changes by the prophet Joseph Smith, but everything in Revelation seems to cross-reference to something else in Revelation, so I hope this study guide will become some benefit to you. Another quick note when studying the book of Revelation. Many things are not sequential or chronological. He seems to jump back and forth in time and sometimes between pre-mortal existence and our second estate here on earth. So if we take the Joseph Smith translation of Revelation 13 and 14 and we read it, what do we learn? John sees a sign in the likeness of the kingdoms of the earth rise out of the sea and stand on the beach having seven heads, ten horns, and ten crowns with the name Blasphemy. And it looks like a leopard with feet of a bear and the mouth of a lion. 
This beast is set in power and authority by another creature, the dragon. One of these heads is wounded and then healed. Many worshipped the beast, believing that no one can make war with him. The beast blasphemies against God for three and a half years, and the beast makes war with the saints, and it doesn't go well for the saints. In fact, it says that anyone who doesn't have their name written in the book of life is worshiping the beast. Then John gives a warning to those that are going to follow the beast. He says you will be led into captivity and have to take up arms against everyone unless you are one of the saints and you will have to endure persecution. Then another beast comes out of the earth with two horns, like a lamb, and he speaks like a dragon. The new beast forces everyone to worship the old beast, and even shows miracles to everyone and tells everyone to make an image to the beast. This image is then given the power to speak, and anyone who doesn't worship the image is killed. Then this is where the mark of the beast comes in. As the beast causes everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And if they don't get it, they can't buy or sell. Then he says the number of the beast is 666, and that we need to remember that. Then in chapter 14, the Savior appears with 144,000 with God's name written in their foreheads with several verses describing the 144,000. Then he sees an angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to all the earth and warning them of the coming judgments. Then another angel announces that Babylon has fallen. Then another angel starts checking to see who has the mark of the beast in their hand and forehead because they will receive God's wrath in the form of fire and brimstone forever and ever. Then any of the saints that perished are blessed and find rest. Then a bunch of angels come out of the clouds and reap the earth with the wrath of God, causing so much death that it forms a river of blood that comes up to a horse's bridles for 200 miles. In chapter 19, it gives a bit more commentary, and I'll just mention verse 20, which says, And the beast was taken with him, the false prophet, and wrought miracles before him with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire and burning with brimstone. So we have dragons, beasts, false prophets that bring about miracles that deceive most people, kings and crowns and armies and wars. So I'm sure that clears everything up for everyone, right? Thanks for watching. I'm just kidding. There's so much we need to unpack here. Let's go back to chapter 13. There is continual endless debate and speculation on every aspect of these chapters we just went over. I don't know what the beast is. I have my ideas just like everyone else, but that doesn't matter. I'm not going to speculate here on the meaning of the seven heads, the ten horns, and the crowns, or the shape of the beast, or what it may represent, or the dragon, or the other beast, or the wounding of the head, or the healing of its head. One main reason for not speculating is a bad habit that people have when attempting to understand the book of Revelation and other last days symbolic type scriptures. We have all been so conditioned that we are the chosen generation and that the second coming is so close that we begin to map these symbols to things that we see in the world around us. This is the same thing that the saints did at the time of Christ and the same thing the early saints did 200 years ago and what we do today. These symbols may represent something that we can't see yet in the future. So don't put stakes in the ground around interpretation of symbolic imagery or you're going to get yourself into trouble. This is what happened during COVID. Many people were convinced that COVID was the great scourge talked about in the last day's signs of the times, and it was not. Or everyone is related to somebody that's got a blessing or has it in their patriarchal blessing that they will see the second coming and they don't even consider that that could be as a resurrected being post-death, or that it was based on worthiness that wasn't met, or the giver of the blessing was just wrong, and yes, that happens. We have this self-centered society where we think everything is about us rather than seeing that some of these things likely are beyond our current vision and more time needs to pass before we will see them fulfilled. That being said, more than ever, I'm seeing technologies, political strife, government conspiracies, and many other things that do seem to match more of my own interpretation of what needs to happen. So we are getting ever closer, but I don't know how long or short it will be before we all see this. Let's talk for a moment about what some have theorized about some of these things and the symbols that John talks about. 
I'll focus on just two elements, the mark of the beast itself and the number of the beast being 666. We can't possibly talk about everyone's individual theory or the nuances therein. We also aren't going to go back in time and map 666 to the Roman Empire and the name of Caesar and so forth. Let's just talk about it in today's context and based on my limited experience, it seems that back in the 80s, I started hearing a lot about this and the idea is that people would get a barcode on their hand or forehead like some dystopian society. This theory took on a couple of different forms. One was that the barcode system had 18 digits broken into three segments, hence 666. But more focus was put into how barcodes were used and set up, specifically that within most barcode systems where the configuration and thickness of each line segment is a different number, which is called the anatomy of a barcode, there are usually three lines that are longer to mark the beginning, middle, and end of the barcode, and use the number 6, or the double thin lines, for those bookmarks or what they call guide bars. Hence the barcode is 666. As technology advanced, so did the theories around the mark of the beast. In the late 90s, I was working in information security, which is now called cybersecurity, and the idea around the mark of the beast seemed to change some. Who needs a physical barcode tattooed on their body, especially their forehead, when biometrics make all that go away? The original thought was that fingerprint technology can take care of the right hand. But later with retinal scanners, that could be the mark of the beast in your forehead. Imagine John the Revelator trying to describe something like this. You can imagine him saying that there is a mark in your right hand or in your forehead. When it comes to cybersecurity, the best way to eliminate fraud is by implementing biometrics. See, if you only have a password that protects your money, that is called single factor authentication. Something you know. Not very safe because if someone learns or guesses your password, they have access to your finances. That is why two-factor authentication systems are used at banks. When you take money out of the ATM, you have to provide a card, that is the first factor and it's something you physically have, and then you have to provide a PIN number, the second factor as something that you know. This better protects your assets. However, fingerprint scans and retinal scans are biometrics and are neither something you know or something you have. They are something you are which is a higher level of security, which is probably why people associated it with the mark of the beast. As technology has evolved, so did the thoughts around the mark of the beast. Small microchips were being developed with full RFID tracking as well as the ability to store and transmit data. These can offer more than just authentication or identity verification, which could make them even more usable in a society relying on them to buy and sell, as the prophecy in Revelation states. Some have theorized the use of a chip to interact with a new worldwide central banking cryptocurrency. So as we think about this, people begin to imagine getting their implants on the right hand, but that doesn't make sense for your forehead. Well, Elon Musk's Neuralink brain implant answered that question. So now we move into the realm of transhumanism, which is a far cry from what we were imagining in the 80s and before. So this leads me back to that previous warning about understanding prophecy. We have a tendency to want to answer the question of prophecy with our current understanding of the world and the technology we currently have. So when barcodes are the things, we fill in the blank with barcodes. When brain and hand implants are the thing, we believe that must be the answer. This can be dangerous because we get so focused and sure on one particular thing that it's the answer. If it isn't, we begin to lose faith in the prophecy at all or some technologies become so prevalent that we get desensitized to their use. But perhaps it isn't technology based at all. Is this how John the Revelator in Vision on the Isle of Patnos really would have seen and explained our day today, where so much of what he writes in normally is in Hebrew poetry and symbolic form? This is what it says in the New Testament student manual for the Mark of the Beast. It says, quote, In contrast to the righteous who keep their covenants with God and receive his protecting seal in their foreheads, the wicked who worship the beast receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. This may symbolize that the wicked show by their actions, hands, and beliefs, heads, that they do the will of the beast and accept his ideology. However, the precise meaning of the mark has not been revealed. 
So perhaps this is all purely symbolic. In some ways, this makes sense, because John also describes the seal that is placed in the foreheads of the righteous followers of Christ. And I don't know too many people that believe a physical mark, tattooed, stamped, or otherwise etched into our foreheads is going to happen. Symbolically looking at the number 666, the same New Testament student manual speaks of the number 666 in this way. John wrote that the number of the beast is 603 score and 6. Over the centuries, the number of the beast 666 has intrigued countless individuals and led to many speculative interpretations. The Lord has not revealed the meaning of this symbolic number. Some commentators have noticed that since 6 is one less than 7, a number representing divine perfection and completeness, 666 may emphasize the imperfect and counterfeit character of Satan and his followers. Also, a mark in scripture often refers to a curse. So some believe that by choosing Satan and following after those precepts, that the mark of the beast is a curse. In fact, at the end of the book of Revelation, in chapter 22, verse 3, as Christ begins his reign after the wicked leaders have been destroyed, it says, quote, And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and his servant shall serve him. And to reiterate, there is no official church position on either the mark of the beast or the number 666. So everything that you have ever heard, including everything in this video, is pure speculation. Perhaps it will be something physical, and perhaps it is something symbolic or spiritual. Perhaps it is based on technology that exists today, and perhaps it will be based on something in the future. So rather than focusing on what the mark of the beast will be, it seems to me the better approach is to figure out the conditions that will exist at the time this will be implemented so that we can be on the right side. What do I mean by the right side? Well, if you read those chapters in Revelation carefully, you will remember that the mark of the beast was forced upon all both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond. And this will cause a division between those that get the mark and those that do not. Those that get it are following Satan, and those that do not are following the Savior. So this is a big moment on picking sides, and no one will be able to have one foot in the kingdom and one foot in Babylon any longer. One condition that it seems clear will happen as a result of this is the persecution of those that do not get the mark of the beast. The verses in these chapters speak at length about massive persecution that comes upon the saints. I believe that you can then look at other verses elsewhere in Scripture about the last day's persecution of the saints and use them as additional context here. So I made several other videos that kind of orbit this topic, which include persecution of the saints, times of the Gentiles being fulfilled, our return to Missouri, and famine, as well as other last day's videos. As you study this subject further, I think you can see that the mark of the beast, whatever it turns out to be, instigates many of those last day's events. This can help us pinpoint when this will happen, which in my opinion is much more important than how it will happen. What else do we know about this future time? Well, Revelation chapter 6, verse 6 talks about buying a measure of wheat for a penny, indicating famine conditions at the time. We can read in many other scriptures about a great famine in the last days. And you could see how an oppressive government, group, or other organization could force people to comply with some kind of an identity system to receive their food rations. But if you are using that Revelation study guide I mentioned before, you can clearly see that chapters 1 through 7 describe events through the first 6,000 years of the earth. And then chapters 8 through 22, with only a few exceptions with premortal events and such, talk about second coming events. So what would a famine discussed in chapter 6 long before the second coming events have to do with the sign of the times? Now this is just 100% Kevin Prince speculation here. But do you remember the story of the fall of Jericho? How the army of Israel walked around the city of Jericho for six days and then on the seventh day they walked around Jericho seven times and then they blew their trumpets and the walls fell? I can't help shake the feeling that this event mirrors what we read about in the book of Revelation. As you read the early chapters of the events that happened in the first 6,000 years, those same events seem to happen again all just prior to the second coming. Like we are going through each 1,000 year period and then going through it all in rapid fashion again before the final trumps are blown and the world falls. That is why a famine or some other event described before chapter 8 can still give us hints into what happens later. Incidentally, archaeological evidence points to a massive earthquake at Jericho. 
at this time, and it will be a massive earthquake that happens just prior to the Lord's second coming. So we have a future famine that most of the world isn't prepared for, which is putting pressure on people to accept the mark of the beast to buy and to sell. Controlling groups attempt to force everyone to get the mark of the beast, and the righteous do not, which leads to tremendous persecution and even bloodshed of some of the righteous. This could be a major factor in when a remnant of the church, those that remain righteous, flee to Zion, which also marks the end of the times of the Gentiles. This might also explain why not all of the saints go to Missouri, as many of them very well may get the mark of the beast. And the saints will not all be protected physically from this. Those verses we read, including chapter 14, verse 13, which talk about the dead which die in the Lord. The New Testament student manual discusses it in this way. John heard a voice saying, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. This suggests that although the Lord's people generally will be protected from many of the judgments to come, some righteous individuals will die in the calamities and tribulations of the last days. Nevertheless, to those who are righteous, death is associated with peace and joy. They rest from their labors and their works do follow them. I think it is pretty clear that these events are what Christ foretold in the New Testament when giving the parable of the wheat and the tares. Remember, the first harvest is when they gather the righteous from the wicked. The righteous get physically moved to Zion. Then the wicked can be bundled and burned at Christ's coming. But we can be confident that the good guys win. God wins. There is victory over the beast. In fact, the entire book of Revelation is the story of how God overcomes wickedness, evil, and Satan. How God wins. So perhaps rather than focusing on what the mark of the beast will be, we need to focus on physical and even more so the spiritual preparations that we need to receive a seal in our foreheads. Regarding spiritual preparation, the time will come when the prophet will tell us not to participate in the mark of the beast, whatever that turns out to be. Have you seen how our society within the church has begun to divide around whether we should follow what the prophet says or not? I see a bigger and bigger divide around following the prophet, and if we aren't sure-footed with the prophet, when something like this happens, I can't imagine many landing on the right side of it. So to stay spiritually sure-footed, we need to have our own testimony, no borrowed light, be in lockstep with the prophet and his counsel, live the commandments, and know who we are and what we stand for and why. Be pure and be able to receive personal revelation and have the power of God in our lives. Regarding the timing, it seems clear that all of this happens before the second coming and even more specifically before Christ saves the Jews, which is a different event than when he returns in glory. So I hear lots of people that are excited for the second coming, and that's great. But what I think many of us don't realize is that all of these things have to happen prior to that time. It won't be easy, and it won't be quick. It's like I've said before. It isn't like you're going to wake up one day, Christ shows up, and that means shorter lines at the Walmart going forward. Everything in our world will change. The bottom line on this entire topic is... One, we don't know what the mark of the beast will be, and it really doesn't do a lot of good speculating. Two, it is better to understand the conditions that will exist so we can be prepared and ready to make the right decisions rather than being forced to make a bad decision. And three, are we getting prepared as it directs us to do in the temple for a righteous life living the law of consecration? Are we willing to take the more difficult righteous path or the easy now and suffer later path that Satan proposes? Are we willing to follow the prophet no matter what? I remember when the announcement was made going from three-hour church to two-hour church. Everyone was on the prophet's bandwagon saying, that is one inspired man, and so forth. What would have happened if he had announced going from three-hour church to four-hour church? Would all of those people have been on the prophet train then, exclaiming how he's such an inspired man? What if the prophet announced at General Conference that we need to once a month go door to door in our neighborhoods and preach the gospel? Who is willing to do that? Are we only following the prophet when our lives are getting easier? Or are we willing to follow him when in the future hard and difficult times come as a result of his direction? Remember in Revelation 11, verse 1, John is asked to take a reed like unto a rod, which is a measuring device, and measure the temple. 
Symbolically, he is measuring the worthiness of the saints using canon, which is what that device is called. So we, as saints, are being measured against the commandments and the word of God to see if we are not only worthy, but willing to follow him no matter what. So I hope this video helps you orient your thinking around the mark of the beast as we can only guess what it will be. I think it is far more important to focus on the why those conditions will occur and how we can prepare for them rather than the what. As you can see, our thoughts and mindset have changed over time and likely will change in the future as we get closer and closer to this event. In the meantime, we should focus on being more like our Savior. Thanks for watching.